start telling lies, you have to tell extra lies to cover up the first one, and you get into the most hopeless misunderstanding. Speech collapses. And, of course, the intoxication is the same problem as the exploitation of the passions. So there's a purely kind of practical, expedient, utilitarian approach to morals. There's another side to this, which doesn't enter into the, into the precepts, which I will explain later. So, that's the third phase of the Eightfold Path. Then the, no, the second phase. Then the third phase has to do with your mind, with your state of consciousness. And this has to do with what we would ordinarily call meditation. There are the two final, the, the seventh and eighth uh, aspects of the path are called Samyak Shmriti and Samyak Samadhi. <clears throat> Shmriti means recollection. That's the best English word for it. Now, do you understand? The word recollect is to gather together what has been scattered. What is the opposite of remember? Obviously, dismember. What has been chopped up and scattered becomes remembered. So, in the Christian scheme, do this in remembrance of me. You see, the Christ has been sacrificed, chopped up. But the Mass is celebrated in remembrance. One of the old liturgies says the wheat which has been scattered all over the hills and grows up is gathered again into the bread, remembered. Go back to your Hindu basis. The world is regarded as the dismemberment of the self, the Brahman, the Godhead. The one is dismembered into the many. So remembrance is realizing again that each single member of the many is really the one. So that's recollection. You can think of it too in another way, and it's really the same way if you think it through. I'm going to leave you with a few puzzles so that you can think them through and I won't explain them. But another way is to be recollected is to be completely here and now. Are you here and now? Are you really here? There was a wise old boy who used to give lectures on these things, and he would get up and not say a word. He would just look at the audience. And he'd examine every person individually. And they'd all start feeling uncomfortable. He wouldn't say anything. He'd look at them all. And then he'd suddenly say, Wake up! <laughs> You're all asleep. And if you don't wake up, I won't give you any lecture. <laughs> are you here, recollected? <coughs> See, most people aren't. They're bothering about yesterday and wondering what they're going to do tomorrow. And aren't all here. That's the definition of sanity, to be all there. <coughs> so to be recollected is to be completely alert, available for the present. Because that's the only place that you are ever going to be in. Yesterday doesn't exist. Tomorrow never comes. There is only today. A great Sanskrit sort of invocation says, Look to this day, for it is life. In its brief course lie all the realities of our existence. Yesterday is but a memory. Tomorrow is only a vision. Look well, then, to this day. Such is the salutation of the dawn.
So, uh, Shmiti means then recollectedness in the sense of being all here. In the sense that this is the only, only where there is. Then beyond that comes samadhi. Again, notice the presence of this word sam, sam. Samadhi is uh, integrated consciousness in which there is no further separation between the knower and the known, the subject and the object. You are what you know. Now we think in the ordinary way that we are the witnesses of a constantly changing panorama of experience from which we as the knowers of this in a way stand aside and watch it. We think of our minds as a kind of tablet upon which experience writes a record and the tablet is always there although the experience goes by. And eventually the experience, by writing so much on the tablet, wears it out. It's all scratched away and you die, see? But actually, if you will investigate this, and you have to experiment on this because I cannot explain it to you in words, you can only find it out for yourself. There is no difference between the knower and the known. When you say, I see a sight, I feel a feeling, you are using redundant language. <coughs> I see implies the sight. I feel implies the feeling. Do you hear sounds? No. <laughs> you just hear. Or you can say, there are sounds. Either one will do. So you will find, if you thoroughly investigate the process of experiencing, that the experiencing is the same as the experiencer. And this is the state of samadhi. I put it originally in this form, that the organism and the environment are a single behavioral process. So likewise is the knower and the known. So you, as someone who is aware, and all that you are aware of is one process. That is the state of samadhi. And you get to that state by the practice of meditation, Every Buddha figure practically is seen in the sitting posture of meditation, which is sitting down quietly and being aware of all that goes on without comment, without thinking about it. And when you stop categorizing verbalizing, talking to yourself inside your head, but naturally the separations between, for example, knower and known, self and other, simply vanish. Can you point to the difference between my five fingers? Where will you put your finger if you want to point to the difference? You see, the idea of difference is an abstraction. It just isn't there in the physical world. Of course, that's not saying that the fingers are joined like a duck's claws with a web, but that it's just that. They're not the same. That's an idea. They're not different. That's an idea. And these ideas 
just aren't here. See? You can't point to it. You can't put your finger on it. Get then to the state of affairs where you see the world free from concepts. That's what Buddhists mean by void. When they say uh, the world is basically, uh, they use the phrase shunya. That has a meaning of like empty, void. Everything is shunya. This has certainly also the meaning of, of anitya, of transience, but basically it means <coughs> You can't catch the world in a conceptual net. Just if you try to catch water in a net, it all slips through. If you try to tie up water in a paper package or grab it in your hands, it all flows through. So, Shunya, it doesn't really mean that the world itself, that the energy of the world is nothing at all. It means that no concept of it is valid. You cannot make any one idea, or belief, or doctrine, or system, or theory, tie the thing up. So, if you go through this, and you get completely blown out, and released, and are in the state of nirvana, <coughs> for no reason that anybody can explain, there are, just as, for example, as I pointed out, when you see that you can't change yourself, you can't lift yourself up by your own bootstraps, you then get a new access of psychic energy. So in exactly the same way, when you get to this state of nirvana, there wells up from within you what the Buddhists call karuna or compassion. The sense that you aren't different from everybody else. Everybody else's suffering is your suffering. And so this tremendous sense of solidarity with all other beings arises. So that he who reaches nirvana doesn't, as it were, withdraw into a sort of isolated peace, but is always coming back into the world, into the difficulties, into the problems of life, uh, in compassion for everyone else. You can't be saved alone, because you're not alone. You are the whole cosmos. <coughs>